This is the Rokinon 12mm wide-angle lens created specifically for the mirrorless camera market. Also sold under the brand names Samyang or Bauer, it features an incredibly fast maximum aperture of 2.0. Like most other Rokinon lenses, this 12mm follows the principles of great performance for a low price. The company has sort of carved out a niche for themselves in the lens market on this principle. They forego a lot of conventional principles like autofocus or image stabilization and put all the R&D money into optical performance. They're quite well built for the price, but their true value is in the picture quality for what you spent. I'm going to break this review down into several parts. We're going to start off just taking a quick look at the lens and its physical features. After that, I'm going to show some examples of how this lens shoots and the way it performs optically uh, with a few targets and a few sort of ad hoc tests. And then we're going to go into some real world examples about how this lens actually works out in the field since I've been using it for a good part of a year now. Consider this sort of like a long-term report and it's going to be based in photography. I haven't done any video with this lens whatsoever. Before we get too far into this review, I want to take a minute and show you guys who this review is actually for. And, uh, well, just to save people time, if this isn't the right video for them, if you've taken a look at the camera market in the last uh, couple of years, you have seen that most of the sales are still comprised of compact and point and shoot cameras. There is a big piece of that still as DSLRs and this little chunk and you'll have to excuse me because I'm trying to draw this while looking through the back of another camera this is the mirrorless market which has been for the last few years the micro four thirds you've got the Canon M's you've got like my camera the Fuji X's, then you have the Samsung NX's, which I've never actually seen one in real life, but that's another story. And then you have the Sony E mounts, and I'm going to put an asterisk next to that because it's sort of a full frame, but you can also kind of use it in a crop mode, I think, is from what I've heard. So, anyhow, this piece, this piece right here is really who is going to benefit the most from watching this review. The DSLR folks, you guys get another uh, another lens, I'm sorry, from Rokina, and that is their 12mm 2.8. And you can sort of group the uh, Sony one in there too because I think they make an E-mount for that. Here is the lens itself, the Rokinon 12mm 2.0, made especially for crop sensor cameras. This lens has a, uh, well it's got two controls, full-time manual, aperture, and focus ring, and no electronics whatsoever. Due to that, you'll have to get used to the fact that this won't record any information to your camera once you take a picture with it. So years down the line, when you're wondering how you got this really nice picture that you shot, and you're wondering what settings you used and what aperture and all that sort of thing, uh, you're just not going to get that with this lens. That's just something you're going to have to remember or somehow record it on your own if you'd like. The uh, aperture ring goes in mid detents, so between every printed number, between every full stop of the aperture, there is a middle landing all the way down from 2 to f22. Like all uh, Rokinon and Samyang lenses, this one has a really long and damped focus uh, throw. 
there's the infinity mark. It's got this little dog leg, and it sort of tells you that that is where infinity is. So you can sort of make the mistake of going past infinity, and you'll actually go out to a blurry picture again. So if you're doing like astrophotography, where you're in the dark and you're just trying to focus into the night, I figured out that that little dog leg means you want infinity to be there, not all the way to when the lens actually stops. Uh, the exterior finish is plastic, as most of uh, Rokinons are, except for the metal mount. They change the different mounts for the different cameras that they make it for. The, uh, the lens hood has a crinkled finish, while the body is smooth. I'm not sure why they went with that decision, but uh, it doesn't really affect anything. It's just something that's kind of funny when you first see it. Oh yes, and it does come with this hood. It is a 67 millimeter uh, front element, and it's also flat, which means you can put a filter on it. So that's kind of nice. In the following series of pictures, I'm going to demonstrate to you how the Rokin on 12mm renders objects and distances, just because it's a wide-angle lens, and wide-angle lenses tend to cause their own special ways of distortion and uh, distance exaggeration. Here's what this lens does. So the scene is going to be pretty simple. I got a few uh, canned foods, and they're all about the same size. They're all 15-ounce cans. Uh, I put three on a little table right in front of the, where the camera's going to be. And then the fourth one is about nine feet away uh, in the back of the living room. The first test is the bouquet test, and uh, seems like a logical place to start, and we'll go on from here. So the way I set this up is I set the camera to its maximum aperture, which is 2.0, and I set the minimum focus that was possible, which on the lens is about two-thirds of a foot. I then proceeded to slide the can closer and closer until the actual label of the can came into focus and I placed it around where the M in the Del Monte is. By doing that, the logo on the can is pretty sharp, while the rest of the room has been thrown into a pretty smooth out of focus state. Now if we go ahead and close the aperture down all the way from 2.0 down to f22, which is as slow as it'll go, we'll get this. The focus is still on the logo, but Compared to the previous picture, the background is now a lot more in focus. And now I know it's really hard to see detail on a YouTube video, so I've gone ahead and put the full-size pictures up on the Flickr, and I've got the links below in the video description. There you can take your time and really examine the details of the pictures. So for the next comparison, I've kept the camera and everything in the exact same place, but instead of a minimum focus, I've turned it all the way to infinite focus. And again, we start at maximum aperture of 2.0, and you can see the amount of blurring in the foreground while the background looks kind of sharp. But it's not really. If you actually go into the full-size files, you'll see the background is still a little blurry, just because the focal point is somewhere way past the confines of the room. With this next picture, we're following the same pattern as we did with the last set, which is set it at minimum aperture now, all the way down to f22, while the focus is still at infinity. Something interesting to note is even with the focus set at infinity, you can actually read the writing on the can from having been placed at the lens's minimum focal distance. And just to round out this set of pictures, here's a shot from where the focus was set on the furthest can in the background. From this I can show you the very slight but noticeable difference between setting the focus on the object in the distance versus setting it straight onto infinity. Here's another test I did, this time for the sake of demonstrating how the 12mm shows distance. Or I should say how it renders distance. What I've done to set up this experiment is placed a bunch of mason jars all in a line about a foot apart, and I'm going to shoot down the length of them with different lenses to show you how they compress the jars differently. We'll start with using the 85mm, which is kind of bordering on a telephoto. And as you know, with telephotos, they tend to stack items together and the distances between them aren't always obvious. They're sort of known for compressing distances together. I've made it a point to try and keep the first jar approximately the same size in every picture. The next lens I shot with was my 27mm, 
which on my Fuji, with its APS-C sized sensor, has a diagonal distance of also 27 millimeters. That means this is as close as I'm going to get to having a normal lens on my camera. Now we get to the 12 millimeter, and as you can see, the distances become greatly exaggerated. This is the nature of wide angles, and it's something you have to pay attention to when you're using one. At this point, some viewers might be thinking, what would it look like if I kept the tripod in the same place and just switched the lenses out, instead of moving the tripod further and further forwards, like I did in the last series, where I was trying to keep that mason jar in the same size on every picture. So I tried that too, and here's how that turned out. We start once again with a line of jars with the 85mm. Now if I keep the tripod in the same place, and only switch the lens out, Here's what it looks like with the 12 millimeter. Things are a little far away and a little hard to see. So let's try zooming in. The resulting view we get, interestingly, looks to be about the same as what it looked like with the 85 millimeter. This actually brings up an interesting phenomenon in photography. What with all the principles about how you should take a portrait of somebody with a telephoto lens and not a wide angle lens because a wide angle lens distorts their face and gives them a big nose and all that stuff. While those principles are sound, the only thing that matters in that regard is the actual physical distance of the camera away from your subject matter. But that's a discussion for a different time and probably another video one day. While we're on the subject of exaggerated distances, I think this is a good time to show you another example. This bookshelf is six feet tall. You may be wondering why I've taken a weird picture of it where I've cut off the top corners, but it's in fact because I can actually reach out my arm and touch it. That is to say, this 12mm lens on my camera, which has a 1.5 crop factor, will actually fit a 6 foot object into the whole frame at arm's length. The last thing I want to quickly show you is how much perspective this lens introduces when you're using it. You'll see the implications of this later on when I show some of the pictures that I've actually taken with it. Okay, now it's time to have a look at what this 12mm is actually like to use in everyday situations. I've had about a year to play with it and use it in different, uh, in different um, tasks. I don't always have it with me. It's not really the right lens for, uh, for across-the-board shooting. We'll go through some usage cases, and uh, I'll have a, a thing or two to say about uh, where I think it's useful and where I think it really isn't. Okay, the first usage case we'll look at are uh, tight spaces. Uh, there's really no substitute for a wide angle when you're trying to shoot in, uh, cl in close quarters, whether it's like interiors like this um, on this really beautiful vacation rental that we took one time. Uh, or your um, workplace party. Whenever you're in close quarters and you need to show a lot of things, wide angle is really the only way to go. The next usage case for a wide angle is an obvious one, and that is landscapes. Uh, landscapes are just natural applications for this lens. These series of pictures were all shot around Keynes Canyon National Park, and the lens does a great job in capturing just the magnificent expanse of that place. And if you think about it, it's sort of a funny task that a wide angle has to do on a landscape. Normally when you're actually there in person, the human eye can see upwards of 170, almost 180 degrees in field of view. But with a camera, you have to try to get that entire view condensed down to a rectangle. Now, I'm not sure if this picture counts as a landscape or not, but it kind of combines the, uh, the aspects of nature with the tight spaces, uh, since this is inside a cave, and this sort of dark setting is where this lens shines. Uh, this shot was taken in the Boyden Caverns, which are also in uh, Kings Canyon National Park. Uh, I had just gone up some stairs from uh, where you can see the rest of the people are scooting through, and I turned around and managed to get both the people in the shot, as well as this uh, calcium formation up in the, uh, the top half of the picture that they call affectionately the wedding cake. Here's another landscape, though this one's a, a cityscape to be exact. Now, this is taken in an intersection at night in Beijing, China on a trip that I went there earlier this year. 
As you can see from the last two pictures, this lens works great for shooting in the dark. A combination of wide angle and uh, super fast means this lens is natural for doing astrophotography, which it is indeed very good for. Alright, next up I have a series of pictures that are taken in the run and gun fashion, and uh, I guess this is as close as I've come to what you would call street photography with this lens. The examples that I'll use are from when I used it on one of the Ciclavia events I went to. Uh, I was on a bike the whole time, so I could only operate the camera one-handed while riding with the other. And, and because I wasn't able to touch the lens, I think I set it on like f4 or 5.6 and I put the focus around five feet in front of me and just relied on its depth of field to keep everything in order. And all I had to do was adjust the exposure compensation on my camera, which I could do with my thumb. So this is sort of like following the classical conventions of street photography where you're locking down focus and uh, aperture and you're just hitting moments as they happen in front of you. And at this point, I think it's a good time to give one of my uh, evaluations about this lens especially in this application, which is kind of a mixed bag. Okay, uh, two good points. One of them is the amount of usable focus I had from such a wide lens meant I never really had to worry about focus. You know, I could just bang away a shot instantly with no delay and uh, pretty much get whatever I was going for. And going hand in hand with that, another benefit of such a wide field of view was that I could take a lot of blind shots and still get what I wanted in the frame and I had to do a lot of this because I had to pay attention to where I was riding while I was taking pictures. So with those two positives, let me show you the other side of the coin, as it were, about the downsides of having such a wide-angle lens. Because let's face it, when you have a lens like this, you get one with the other. They go hand in hand. Remember the example with the bookcase earlier? How even at six feet tall, I was able to fit it into the whole frame of my camera at arm's length. Well, out in the real world, in the same vein, objects that you think are close to you still look far away with this lens. Now, case in point, in this picture, a group of longboarders had pulled up to me up at a stoplight. The guy closest to me was only about three feet away, and yet after I took his picture, I still had a crop into him. Here's an example of the original shot, and the crop I had to do to make it look like there wasn't as much uh, empty space. And he really wasn't all that far away. So you have to remember that this lens really exaggerates distances. And this exaggerated distance thing also makes it a little hard to get into the middle of the action. I tried getting close behind the longboarders once they took off, and even within a couple of feet of getting hit by their poles, as you can see from what I cropped them out of, they still look really far away. Here's one more example. This isn't at the Ciclavia anymore, but uh, it was just a quick vacation snapshot I threw in because it was kind of illustrating the point. Uh, the girl in the red shirt, Sarah, looks like she's 10 feet away from me. But in actuality, I was able to hand stuff to her just by leaning forward without either of us having to get out of the chairs. So just hope these pictures illustrate just how much exaggeration this lens puts into uh, distance into your photos. And finally, we get to the last usage case I want to show you guys, and that is with people. Anytime you have people in the frame with this lens, you have to be careful. The distortion that this lens causes at the edges of the frame aren't as obvious with landscapes, but become very obvious when people are involved. And uh, it's not very flattering. Let me show you. In this picture, I made the mistake of putting someone way too close to the edge and the corner of the frame. Uh, as you saw earlier with the uh, bookshelf with the perspective lines that I overlaid, this lens does some severe things with perspective on large objects close to the lens. And as a result, Nick's head is elongating into the corner of the frame, and his stomach isn't really being helped by the distortion either. He actually said that this was one of the pictures that got him back on track with his diet. Um, but could you imagine if you were out shooting on a paid gig, like, like say, a wedding, and you're working a cramped room uh, during bridal prep, and let's say you bust out this wide angle, and you catch everybody in the frame the whole time, but you get the bride's mother or the bridesmaids in angles like this? You know, shooting people up close with a wide angle, like, nobody would feel flattered with that. And sure, you can tweak around with it in post, 
but there's really only so much correction you can do before you just have to start losing content to cropping. So how do you use this lens with people? Well, at least from what I've found, it's best to show them in their environment from a moderate distance. And I think this is true of wide angles in general. The best use of this lens is in showing something as part of a larger setting. Just like how a telephoto is best used to isolate a subject from the setting, this lens, being the opposite of a telephoto, is best used for placing your subject in their setting. So remember this when using a wide angle with people, at moderate distances, in their environments. Even here in this picture from inside the cave again, the silhouette of the girl in the foreground, you can see is starting to distort into the bottom corner of the picture from how close I was to her. Well, I hope this presentation has been helpful for you. A wide angle like this Rokinon 12mm has a lot of usefulness, but it's also got a lot of peculiarities, and I'm hoping that I've illustrated that clearly enough in this video. If you think it'll be useful for you, don't hesitate to get it. It's a wonderful lens, but just pay attention to its strengths and weaknesses. So with that said, thank you all for watching.